testify that he has never lost a battle. Oh, I'm so glad that I serve a God who is still undefeated. He's still the undisputed champion, and he has never, ever lost a battle. Amen. Thank God for our praise team. Come on and say amen. Amen and amen. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 10. I'd love for you to turn there with me, and then I will go to work because I believe God has a word for us in this place today. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 10. The Bible says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Here into the reading of God's holy word, if I could put a tag on the message, it would simply be standing on the promises. Would you pray with me, Father God, in the name of Jesus we come. God, it's been a great day in your courts. We have sung, we have read, we have prayed, we've baptized, been baptized. It's been a fantastic day. Now, Spirit of the living God, I ask that you would fall afresh on me. God, I pray that you would speak to me and through me, administer to the hearts of your children. And when it's all said and done, may we all be able to testify that we came, encountered you, and will never be the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Standing on the promises. We are living now in some uncertain times. We live in uncertain times in this country, and we live in uncertain times in the world. Each day we wake up, I know I do, with bated breath, wondering how much foolishness, drama, and divisive dissension I'll see on TV. Are you all still with me out there? We're not sure from day to day if we're going to go to war or if we're going to be at peace because of the pitiful, petty, power-hungry leaders who want to flex their political muscles around the world. We live in uncertain times. As a black man in America, I can certainly testify that every time I see a police officer, every time I see a police car, my heart skips a beat because I wonder what will happen if I'm pulled over and what will happen if I say the wrong thing? What will happen if the officer is having a bad day? We live in some uncertain times. Some of us had, uh, had money in the market and we watched over the last few years our money uh, uh, just skyrocket exponentially and then we watched a downward tumble. Some of us are looking at 401ks, 403bs, investment accounts, wondering, am I going to be able to retire when I planned on retiring? And, and there, we live in some really unstable, uncertain times. There, there are people who are on Social Security, or on fixed incomes, wondering if they're going to have to go back to work because everything is going up. Gas was going down a few weeks ago. Now, gas is back on the rise. I, I'm telling you, we live in some uncertain times. There, there's very little that we can actually be certain of these days. As a matter of fact, they, you, you, you meet somebody and you fall in love with that person. And I, I tell people in premarital counseling, make sure you've seen their birth certificate because there's some stuff you just can't be sure of anymore. 
And now you can amend your birth certificate, so you really can't be sure. I mean, I mean, there, there, we, 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 there is very little that, that, is un, that is certain. We live with so much uncertainty that it's difficult to be certain about anything. As a matter of fact, one person says the only thing you can be sure of is that you are not as sure as you think you are about the thing that you are sure of. Benjamin Franklin says that the only thing you can be sure of is death and taxes. And, and, and the truth is, my brothers and sisters, that, that, that we're not even sure of death and taxes. Are you all still with me out there? Because some of us have figured out how to evade taxes, and some of us have the faith that Jesus is going to come back again, and some of us are going to evade death. And so there's very little that we can be sure of. I think the hymn writer was thinking about our day and age when the hymn writer said, the time we live in, live in is filled with swift transitions. Not on earth unmoved can stand. But the hymn writer says we ought to build our hopes on things eternal and hold on to God's unchanging hand. Today, I want us to look back at Brother Abraham because I believe Brother Abraham knew how to put his hand in God's unchanging hand. The text that we read today tells us that, that Abraham was following God, looking for an inheritance, but going to a city whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11 verses 8 to 10 affirms that he went through a season of, of letting go of God's hands and, and, and he did get ahead of God, but the truth is that he ultimately came back to understanding God's plan in his life and following God wherever God would lead him. He gets back to following God's will and God's way and that's what the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand today that though Abraham lived with a level of uncertainty, he found certainty in his God. I know many of us live with a level of uncertainty and there is a temptation for us to be like Abraham because Abraham would get ahead of God in God delivering on the promise that he made to Abraham. Abraham, uh, those of you that are Bible scholars remember this story, that God had told to Abraham that he would make of his family many nations and, and that Abraham's descendants would be numerous like the sand of the sea. But Abraham could not understand how God was going to make that happen because Abraham's wife Sarah was 90 years old and still had not had a child. She was 90 when she had her first child. That's why some of us ought not give up hope. I wish I had a witness in this place because, uh, uh, because Sarah was 90 when she had her first child and Abraham was 100 when he had a child with his wife. And, and, but Abraham and Sarah, because of their advancement in age and because Sarah had already passed through that horrible uh, uh, furnace called menopause, uh, they did not believe that God could actually fulfill the promise. So Abraham and Sarah concocted a plan that Abraham would sleep with Hagar and Hagar would bear a child. Hagar was, was a handmaid to Abraham and so, and so Hagar would bear a child and that child would be Ishmael and they believed that that would be the child of the promise, that that would be uh, uh, the child that God would use to bless the world and make many nations but the truth is that all Abraham and Sarah did was demonstrate a lack of faith demonstrate that they would preempt God and they would muddy the religious scene for centuries and millennia. You see, because, I, I hope I haven't lost anybody, because Abraham and Sarah have this foolish idea of Abraham sleeping with Hagar, Hagar would bear a child called Ishmael, and, 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 and my brothers and sisters of the Islamic faith believe that Ishmael is the legitimate child of Abraham's promise. 
They believe that Abraham, when he dispelled uh, uh, Hagar and her son Ishmael, that they went to the Mecca and they built, the, they found at the Mecca the Kaaba, and that is the is the foundation, the genesis of Islam. Now, those of us that are of the Christian faith don't believe that Ishmael was the child of the promise. We believe that the child of the promise, the child that God had promised to Abraham, was the child that Abraham would have with Sarah, that that child is Isaac, and Isaac would, would, would be the, the, the progenitor of Jacob, and Jacob is the father of Israel, the 12 nations of Israel, 12 tribes of Israel, and the Christian uh, faith that we have today. And so Abraham's lack of faith merely divided the religious scene and muddied the waters. So now you have a situation where Christians and Muslims, though we have the same common ancestors, cannot get along. Why are you all so quiet on me in here? But Abraham, that was a moment of Abraham's lack of faith. But I think the Bible in Hebrews 11 is trying to highlight Abraham's faith. And I think that it's important to note that there are people who are men and women of faith who have bad moments. There are people who are men and women of faith who make bad decisions. There are people who are men and women of faith who have lapses of judgment. And it is extremely problematic that we often judge people on their bad moments. That we often judge people on their bad judgment calls. That we often judge people on their worst decisions. I don't believe that the Bible looks at people and evaluates their life in that way. The Bible looks at the totality of one's life. It looks at the desires of one's heart. The Bible does not subscribe to cancel culture as we do. If the Bible subscribed to cancel culture, uh, then we would have to take away uh, maybe three quarters of the songs. Why y'all so quiet on me out there? I was, I was, I was, I was talking to somebody, uh, a, a person, and, and the person said to me, uh, do you listen to R. Kelly music? And I, I, I said to them, I, I don't see nothing wrong with listening to R. Kelly. I still believe I can fly. Are you all still with me out there? And, and they said to me, uh, we, we canceled R. Kelly. We don't, we don't listen to R. Kelly anymore. And, and I said to myself, man, that's tough because R. made some real bad decisions. But I don't believe that we ought to judge people and cancel people based upon the worst decisions of their life. But at some point, we ought to look at the totality of who they are and what their contributions have been to our society. Now, I'm not defending R. I'm, I'm not talking about R, I'm talking about Abraham. I want y'all to understand that Abraham made some bad decisions in his life, but overall Abraham was a man of faith. And you may be here and you made some dumb decisions. You slept with the wrong person. You found yourself messing around with crack. You found yourself drinking at the casino, just acting a fool, gossiping, just doing some ridiculous stuff. And I want you to know that good people, people of faith, make bad decisions. Decisions. And I don't think we ought to cancel people just because they made a bad decision here or there. Now, if you decide that you're going to make a bad decision and you're going to stick with it and that's what it's going to be for the rest of your life, then maybe you ought to be canceled. But Abraham was not like that. He had some falls, some lapses, but Abraham overall was a man of faith. I think in church we've got to turn the temperature down and allow for people who have made mistakes to still be engaged in service to the Lord. Abraham was a man. Now that, that stuff, that whole section wasn't even in my notes. So you all stick with me in here. I was trying to get done in 20 minutes and I, just, I blew it. Uh, but I want you all to get this, that Abraham uh, was a man of tremendous faith. He put his faith in God not knowing where he was going. The Bible says by faith Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed and went out not knowing where he was going. Putting your faith in God 
God is allowing God to lead you though you may not know the way and you may not even know the destination. So following after God means that you will allow God to take you someplace and you won't even know when you got to where God was taking you because you didn't know where you were going to begin with. See, following God is not akin to following a GPS. Because when you follow a GPS, you put in your destination. You tell the GPS where you're trying to go, but you just simply don't know how to get there. When you follow God, what you're saying to God is, God, I don't know where to go, and I don't even know how to get where I don't know where to go. Are you all feeling me out there? And so the Christian experience is putting tremendous faith in God in the fact that God knows and the fact that God knows how to navigate us to the place where God wants us to be. So there's a story told about a man. Uh, a nurse told this story that there was a man who, who went to uh, get his stitches taken out. And, and he got there at about 8.30 in the morning and he was rushing because he had an appointment to get to. And the nurse saw him sitting there impatient, and she said, I, I, I know it, nobody's going to be able to help this man, so let me go over and help him because he's going to miss his appointment. And so she starts to evaluate his wounds, and things look good, and she gets what, what, what she needs to remove his sutures and redress his wound. And while taking care of him, uh, she asked him why he was in such a hurry. The gentleman told her that he had to get to the nursing home because he needed to eat breakfast with his wife. And, and, and she said to him, well, well, can't your wife just wait a little while, uh, uh, you, even if you're running late? And he says, you don't understand because my wife has Alzheimer's disease. And so, and, and so as she finished dressing his wounds, she asked if, she would, if his wife would be upset because he got there late. And, and he said to her, uh, my wife does not know who I am anymore. So she said to him, then why do you go every day to have breakfast with somebody who does not know who you are? And he said to her, I, she does not know who I am, but I know who she is. I wish I had a witness in this place. And when we put our faith and trust in God, what we're saying is, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know how to get where I don't know where to go. But I'm trusting that there is a God who knows the way and he can navigate me to that place where I need to get to. I may not know fully, but God knows me and God knows where I need to go. My Bible says that we see through a glass dimly. We don't fully comprehend. We don't fully understand but oh I'm so glad that when I cannot comprehend that my God's comprehension is never exhausted because scripture teaches me that his ways are not my ways and that his thoughts are not my thoughts and and, and, and one of my favorite writers puts it this way that higher than the highest human thought is God's ideal for his children and so God has things for me that I cannot even consider in my mind and so and so and so Abraham was able to follow God because he had the assurance that God knew him and God knew where he needed to go and God knew the way to get Abraham to where he needed to go here's something I want to tell you that faith in God means more than hearing God man people always talk about how much they believe how much they embrace God how much they go to church, how much they read and know scriptures. But I want you to know that that's all about hearing God. But God says, I want you to do more than hear me. I want you to heed me. The Bible says that we ought to not just be hearers of the word, but, but doers of the word. My mother used to tell me when I was young that obedience was better than sacrifice. I wish I had a witness in this place. See, it was not just about what I believed. It was what I did about what I believed. Dang, y'all are quiet on me in here. It's not just so much what I say or what I have heard, 
but it's what I demonstrate through my behavior that attests to my real faith. See, it's one thing for me uh, as a little boy to look at my mother and say, Mommy, I agree that my room ought to be clean. It's quite another thing to actually clean the room. And see, many of us, in our relationship with God, we confess and agree to a set of ideals, but those ideals don't impact our behavior. Dang. Am I preaching to anybody in this place? It's not enough to just agree, but you got to try your best to obey. See, it's not enough to just say, you know what, I agree, my body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and I ought to take care of it, but then you drinking a little bit of brandy. Oh, y'all don't drink brandy. Vodka. Okay, y'all don't drink vodka. I was preaching the other day. I was preaching the other day somewhere else and I said to, uh, I said to the congregation, I said, um, you know, uh, uh, I said something about Hennessy, right? And somebody came up to me. She said, Pastor, I know you old. She was like in, in her 20s. She said, Pastor, I know you old. I said, how you know I'm old? She said, we don't drink a Hennessy no more. I said, I said, oh, so tell me what you drink so I can, I can make it a little more relevant in the sermon. But see, what I'm trying to say is it's one thing to agree and it's another thing to actually practice. And see, what we have often in church is people who agree to a set of principles or to a set of ideals but don't actually practice that in their life. And that is called hypocrisy. But Abraham was the kind of person who when he believed something, he acted on that which he believed. And I would suggest to you that what we truly believe is revealed in our behavior. So when, 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 so the old folks used to say actions speak louder than words. So your words may say one thing, but your actions say something else. And if I've got to evaluate what you really believe, what you really believe is not displayed in your words, but rather what you truly believe is displayed in your actions. So God says, I want you to move from just believing or knowing, and I want you to move towards doing and being. That's why the hymn says, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. I want to be a Christian. I don't want to profess Christianity. I want to be a Christian. I don't want to have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. I want to be a Christian. I don't want to come to church and worship and clap and sing and go home unchanged. I want, to, I want something to happen in me that now I am that which I sing about and I am that which I pray for. I am that which I read in the scriptures. I become like God. The scripture teaches us that Abraham had this thing called obedience. And even though Abraham didn't know where he was going, he was obedient to follow God. And faith does that. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. says faith is taking the first step when we don't even see the entire staircase. And that's what faith does. It stays the course even when the course is rugged. And sometimes you can't see clear on a sunny day. Sometimes it's dark at midday. Sometimes your strength is gone. Sometimes your resistance is low. But faith kicks in. Faith picks you up. Faith brightens the bleakest day. Faith wipes away your tears. And faith whispers in your heart and your air, I got you. You can journey on. I remember I was on an airplane once. And uh, we started to experience some turbulence, Sister Winston. And yeah, I think I told you all already that I'm not really one that loves airplanes all that much. And so, you know, uh, airplane in turbulence is, you know, just like, that's, that's bad news for me. You know, my stomach and all that kind of stuff, it's just like, oh, Lord. And, and I remember I felt that plane lose altitude. I don't know how much altitude it lost, but I just felt like it just dropped. And I was like, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No, no other help. I... 
And there was something that, that, that happened, though, because the captain came over the loudspeaker. And the captain said, ladies and gentlemen, I, I just want you, I'm going to put the seatbelt sign on, and I want you to put your seat backs and tray tables in their upright lock position. And I, I, I'm, I want you to know that this turbulence is going to last just about 10 minutes. But I promise you we're going to get through it, and it's going to be smooth on the other side. And the knot in my stomach loosened a little bit because I heard the voice of the captain tell me that we're going to get through this thing. And I want you to know that sometimes in life's most turbulent moments, faith is really tried and you wonder, does God even know what God is doing? But it's in those moments that you've got to listen in for the voice of God, believing that God is telling you that he knows how to get you to the other side. Abraham was one who learned the voice of God on his journey. And Abraham learned to wait for God to keep his promises. You see, sometimes God has this way of not keeping his promises when we expect God to keep his promises. Like God told you that everything was going to be all right, but stuff still ain't all right. And you wondering what, what timetable is God on? Because as far as you're concerned, uh, things should have been all right by now. Are you all still with me out there? Because sometimes God takes God's own sweet time in, in answering prayers and delivering on promises. And it can become frustrating because, because you see it as an emergency. Uh, but, but with God, he's just simply just taking his time. He's simply, and see, the challenge is a challenge of perspective. Because we dwell in time and space. But God lives above time and space. So God looks down on time and space. So God sees the day you were born and the day you die at the same time. God sees the day before your diagnosis and the day after you were cured at the same time. And so for us, life plays out in real time, in seconds and in minutes and in hours, in days, in weeks, in months, in years. But for God, he dwells above time. God is outside of time. And sometimes God just does not understand an emergency because God sees the moment where the emergency occurs and the moment after it's resolved at the same time. It's like my little son. There are things for my little son that, sh that are emergencies. And I'm looking at him like, dude, if you only knew what a real emergency is. Are y'all feeling me out there? Man, this little boy will have all kinds of emergencies. My little son, he loves dinosaurs. And he, if he can't find, he has this big old T-Rex. And if he can't find his T-Rex, oh, it's an emergency. Daddy, I can't find my T-Rex. Where is it? And this boy is losing his mind because he can't find an inanimate object that cannot speak, that cannot move on its own. That, that, I mean, it's a toy. But for him, it's a crisis. And I'm sitting there like, boy, I got important stuff to do. I don't have time to be running around here helping you look for a toy. And his hair is on fire. This boy is going crazy. He will not sit. I tell him, listen, here's a stegosaurus. He don't want that. He wants his T-Rex. I say, here, here's a triceratops. He don't want that. He wants his T-Rex. My brothers and sisters, that's how we appear to God at times. We're on fire over little things, over small things. And God is saying, dude, don't you see? I got a whole universe that I'm trying to run. I've got a war that I'm trying to protect people from over here in Ukraine. I got bombs dropping and I'm trying to make sure that my children are not destroyed, that they come to a knowledge of me before they lose their lives. I'm over here trying to beat back uh, the winds of hurricanes and I'm over here trying to help people who are going through uh, earthquakes and I'm over here trying to help somebody get a visa at the embassy and I'm over here trying to help this sister get a man and you are worried... <laughs> see, see, the promise of God doesn't always happen on our terms. But while you are waiting, while you are waiting, and the waiting period is something that, 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 that where, where you really learn. And, 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 and let me just give the secret away that Abraham never saw the promise realized in his lifetime. So, so my question for you is, how do you handle it when God 
has made you a promise. And God fully intends to keep the promise. But you will not be a recipient of the blessing. Dang, y'all are real quiet on me in here today. I never met my great-grandmother. I never met her. She's dead long before I was born. But, and, and we're, we're poor. You know, we grew up real, I mean, my family, you know, we just, we just poor, you know. Poverty in Jamaica, in the country. We just poor. We ain't have much, right? But, but uh, uh, my great-grandmother, Eleanor, uh, they said that that woman was generous. That she used to just give stuff away. She didn't have a lot, but she used to give stuff away. And they would say to her, uh, they call her Miss Ellen. They would say, Miss Ellen, why are you giving everything away? My, my mother told me, she, she was a little girl. She said, Miss Ellen, why are you giving everything away? And Miss Ellen said, listen, the good that I'm doing now is I'm not going to get it back in my lifetime. But the good that I'm doing is for my children and for my grandchildren and for my great-grandchildren. And listen, hey, I, I, I can tell y'all that I've gotten some blessings in my life that I am sure are as a result of what Miss Ellen was doing. Are you all still with me out there? I've gotten some blessings and, and some manifestations of the goodness of God in my life that I did not work for, that I did not earn, that I did not deserve. And I am sure it was God repaying the generosity of Grandma Ellen some four generations ago, and he's visiting it now on her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren today. Are you all still with the preacher out there? So the promise of God does not always, is not always realized in your lifetime. When Abraham died, he didn't have a whole bunch of grandchildren. He didn't have a whole bunch of great-grandchildren. He did not know how God was going to make him the father of many nations. But in the meantime, he learned. That, that, that God had him in a process of spiritual maturity. Because when you are waiting on God, I've learned that God is often developing you, he is disciplining you, and he is doing a work in you. See, spiritual development is like learning to walk. We stand up, we fall, we take a couple steps, we fall, we walk a little better, we wobble, and then we fall, we learn to crawl by faith. We pull ourselves up when we can, we walk more surely, we, then we figure out how to run. My brothers and sisters, receiving the promise of God is just like that. You walk, and then you fall, you stumble, you fall, you see that God is doing something. And here is a spiritual application. That when God is making a mushroom, he may do it overnight. But when he wants to make a giant oak tree, it takes years and years, decades, and even more years. You see, great faith is not matured overnight, but great faith is matured over a period of time. That's why I, I don't envy the faith of people who have been walking with God for a long time because I know that God has been working on them for a, a real long time. They have gone through some hell. They have seen some difficulty. They have experienced some hindrances and some setbacks and denials that I just have not seen. They have life experience that has taught them wisdom and trust and faith in God that I just do not have. And so, my brothers and sisters, sometimes as you're waiting on God, he allows you through some struggles. He allows you through some storms. He allows you through some seasons of suffering. And you've got to be patient because it's all a part of the process. But I learned that God will take care of his children. You see, you see Abraham, the verse 10, and I'm almost done, says, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham learned from living in faith that we're to continue to look in faith. He was looking to God who he believed was building a perfect city and whose, build, whose, whose builder and maker of that city is God. He kept his eyes towards heaven. His life and this world uh, would, uh, would have caused him to turn his gaze downward, but Abraham kept on looking up to God. 
There's the old hymn of the church that says, My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Savior divine. Now hear me while I pray. Take all my guilt away. Oh, let me from this day be wholly thine. Abraham have this faith that says, I'm not going to look down at what's going on around me, but I'm going to lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help, understanding that my help is coming from God. Abraham said, in spite of what I see going on around me, I'm going to keep my eyes on the prize because I believe that God has gone to prepare a place for me. And if he's gone to prepare a place for me, he will come again and receive me unto himself that wherever he is there, I may be also. So whatever happens in my life, however shaky life may get, however dreary and dark it may seem, I've got to look up to God. I am going to keep my eyes on the prize. My help is in God. My help is in him who stood on nothing and stepped from nowhere and said, let there be. And nothing became everything. And nowhere became everywhere. Darkness became light. I've got to keep my eyes on God. I'm going to keep my eyes on the God who called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. I'm going to keep my eyes on the God who has been leading me. And I believe he'll lead me safely home. I've got to put my faith in the promises that that God made me that he will never ever walk away from me that when I go through the waters they won't overtake me and then when I go through the fire I won't be burned oh Abraham had a faith he never li he always lived in a tent Abraham never lived in a house Abraham never saw the descendants that God had promised Abraham never got the title to the land that God said he was going to give him but Abraham died in faith holding on to the promise that the God who told him that he would make him a father of many nations would indeed fulfill his promise to him. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I have encouraged every time I see one of the faithful saints of God close their eyes with the holding on to the promise that the God who called them and the God who shaped them and the God who fashioned them will one day come and take them from death back to life and will give them a home up in glory and so I can sing the words of the hymn today that I'm standing on the promises of Christ my King through eternal ages let his praises ring glory in the highest I'm gonna shout and sing why preacher because I'm standing on the promises of God I'm standing on the promises of God my Savior I'm standing 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 on the promises of God oh my brother Brothers and sisters, when I was a kid, we used to sing a song that asked the question, whose side are you leaning on? And the response would come back, I'm leaning on the Lord's side. Then they would ask, whose side are you standing on? I'm standing on the Lord's side. And can I tell somebody today, I stand, I stand, I stand, I stand. I'm standing on the Lord's side. I stand, I stand, I stand, I stand. I'm standing on the Lord's side. And I shall not be moved. I I shall not be turned around. I shall not be dismayed. I shall not be dissuaded. I shall not be disappointed. Oh, my brothers and sisters, my faith is in him. He called me. He saved me. He sanctified me. He provided for me. And I believe that he will deliver on all of his promises. As a matter of fact, everything that he said he would do, he has done. He told me he was going to bring me through school and he did it. He told me I was going to get a doctoral degree and he did it. He told me he'd give me a house to live in and he did it. He told me he would put clothes on my back and he did it. He told me he'd put food on my table and he did it. He told me he'd give me a wife and he did it. He told me he would give me some kids and he did it. Everything that God has promised to me, he has done it and so there is no reason for me not to believe uh, that everything else uh, will not become manifest in my life. He says, I came that you might have life, uh, but much more have it abundantly. He said that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I believe that he that shall come will come and he will not tarry. Somebody ought to give God a praise in this place. Long story short, whatever he promised you, 
you can believe that God is a God who always honors his promises. He will never make you a promise that he does not keep. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, just play something for me. The scripture says God is not slack concerning his promises. God will always make good on his promise. And while I may not understand what God is doing in the meanwhile and in the in-between time, I know that God will make good on his promise. You know, there was this dreamer, and I'm done. There was this dreamer who lived, who died in the 60s. And he, um, he went down to a march one day in Washington. And he told America about this dream that he had had this dream for the nation that one day sons of former slaves and sons of former slave owners would sit down together at a table of brotherhood and unity. And I always, growing up, I said, that dream <clears throat> sounds good, but there's one thing that will never happen. We never, we'll never have a black president of the United States of America. I, I, I know I'm not the only one. Some of you don't remember it, but I know I'm not the only one. When Brother Barack started running for office, I said, a black man running for president? What's wrong with this dude? I said, I said the colonizers are never going to vote for this guy. I was supporting Hillary, I'll be honest with you, because I said a black man is never going to, to make it. And somehow, white America started feeling Brother Barack. And somehow, he was winning in Iowa. There ain't no black people in Iowa. I mean, maybe like 2%. He was winning in Iowa. I said, boy, maybe he's going to make it. He was doing well in New Hampshire. I mean, real white places in the country. I said, wow, Brother Barack, he's doing all right. I remember election day. I was sitting on the floor in my apartment. I was watching the election results come in. I was watching CNN. I believe it was Wolf Blitzer who came on CNN that night and said, we have breaking news. CNN would like to make a projection that Barack Obama has elected the 44th president of the United States of America. I said, oh my God. In that moment, it was, it was surreal. You know, I had done my part. I, I voted. And you know, election day is always like a group project. You did your part, but you hope everybody else did, did their part. I, I voted. And uh, I, I couldn't believe that Barack had been elected the president. I thought that there was something nefarious that was going to happen. I remember people of color we're saying they're going to kill him, they're going to shoot him, they're going to assassinate him. He's never going to be uh, uh, inaugurated. January 20th, I was watching my TV, and there was such great joy as that black man. He strutted out onto the steps of the Capitol. He put one hand on the Bible, held the other hand in the air, and took the oath of office. And I said to myself, look at that. God made... America a promise through Martin Luther King Jr. that one day the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners would sit down at the table together. That was a promise made I believe in 1963 and it took 45 years and King was dead but the promise came to reality. God kept his promise. I don't know who I'm talking to but I'm trying to tell somebody that we have a God who keeps his promises. And it may be a long time. It may be a difficult road. But we serve a God that keeps his promises. If you're here today and you're saying, Pastor, help me to keep on trusting God because I want to trust his promises. Why don't you stand with me? I want to pray with you. Somebody's saying, Pastor, just help me to keep on trusting God. I want to pray for me. I want to trust God's promises. Just go ahead and stand with me. I want to pray for you. And then... I want to open the doors of the church. There's somebody here today who needs to make a decision for Jesus. There's somebody here today who needs to say, 
all to Jesus I'm going to surrender and all to him I'm going to freely give there's somebody here today who needs to say I'm going to walk with him for the rest of my life you know that you're not where you ought to be with God but you want to get there you know that God has a lot of work to do in your life, but you want to make a surrender to him. Sister Gross came and said that she wanted to be baptized. And I'm talking to somebody who wants to make a surrender to God. Somebody who may want to get baptized. Somebody who may want to walk with God all the way. If that's you, would you come meet me at the altar? I want to pray for you. Somebody saying, Pastor, I know I need to get baptized. I know I need to give my heart to God. I know I need to consecrate myself to him. I know I need to dedicate myself to him. If that's you, would you come meet me at the altar and shake my hand and give Jesus your heart? I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Would you come meet me at the altar right now? Whether you're in the balcony, you're in the lower level, just tell the person next to you, excuse me, I need, to, I need to go to the altar. I need to give my all to Jesus. If that's you, come meet me. Come, come. Would you come? We're going to sing that together. eight I told my mother I wanted to get baptized she said you're too young I won't let you get baptized I remember we went to church that Sabbath we were sitting on the right end of the pew at the back of the church there was nobody else on that pew the pastor was making an appeal just like this I looked at my mother and I started to inch away from her I started to slide down the pew I don't know if she noticed what was going on, but by the time I got to the end of the pew, I just made a run for it. <laughs> I bolted down the aisle. Pastor Lawrence Mason embraced me when I got down the aisle. I looked back, and she was coming. I said, I done messed up this time. Funny, though. She came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That day, both of us got into the baptismal pool. And we both made a decision for God. I don't know who I'm talking to, but there's somebody who needs to come to the altar. I'm not going to belabor this, but would you just meet me at the door? Would you meet Pastor Wyman at the door? Would you just register your decision that you want to go all the way with Jesus? If that's you, make sure you come and let somebody know today that you have decided to go all the way with our Lord and our Savior. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come. Truth is, God, we're thankful that you make promises to us, and many of us are the recipients of promises. You promised us that you would take us from our home nations and that you would uh, bring us here and that you would give us to prosperity, and you have done that. You promised that you would turn Jim Crow segregation. You promised that you would turn discrimination, and, and God, you have done that. For many of us, we're now living in the sunshine and basking in the glory of your promises. We have have achieved because of your goodness you've opened doors you've made a way you've given us access where we did not have access God you have given us promotions that we did not deserve you like the children of Israel you have given us a land uh, that that was not our own you have 
given us crops that we didn't have to plant, houses that we did not have to build, and for all that you have given to us, we are grateful. Now, God, we know that there are other promises yet to be fulfilled, mainly and chiefly the promise of your coming, but we pray that you, the God who never breaks your promise, I would continue to remain faithful to us, though uh, we can be unfaithful at times, that you would continue to be that certainty in our lives, though we can be uncertain. God, we pray that you would hold us in the hollow of your hand because we don't know how to hold you. We pray that you would not allow us to slip away from your grip, from your grip of grace, from your grip of goodness. God, we pray in the name of Jesus that we would experience fellowship with you, that we would experience refreshing and revival, renewal in our walk with you and God for the person who should have come to the altar, for the person who should have said, I yield, for the person who should have said, I want to be baptized, I want to go all the way with Jesus. I pray that you would forgive them for uh, not making that decision, that you would forgive them for not making their way down, for, for forgive them for not making it known. And God, I pray that you would give them another opportunity, that you would put it in their heart to make that decision today and to register it today and to begin preparing a lifetime of service to you. God, in the name of Jesus, we're thankful that you came and you visited us today. Thank you for tabernacling with us and allowing us into your courts we pray that as we disperse from this place that we would not depart from your presence that you would go with us in our cars to our homes to our places of abode to our various destinations that you would watch over us and keep us this week bring us back together next sabbath with a testimony on our lips of the goodness of god for the meal that has been prepared we pray your blessings and god we pray that this church would continue to experience your presence that we would go from strength to strength and from victory to victory and God we have that same faith that was in Abraham that we are looking for a city whose builder and maker is God so as the apostle John prayed even so come Lord Jesus this is our prayer in the mighty and majestic name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ let everybody that loves him declare amen